Hi. So yes, I have a talk today about Ethereum, both the uh, project, the public network, and um, the creation of it. I'm going to mostly talk about what Ethereum is, because hopefully we have people here who know what Ethereum is, but hopefully we also have people here who don't know what Ethereum is. So uh, I'm doing the dangerous thing of trying to pitch this talk to multiple levels. So, um, you know, if there's a bit that is going too deep, then just hold out. And if it's not going deep enough, then please just wait a minute and hopefully we'll get to uh, um, cover all the levels. But I'm going to um, talk about the Ethereum platform in the first instance as a world computer. I think this is a, a helpful way of, um, of thinking about this. So here's a visual depiction to help you uh, imagine this. Um, in the middle, of course, we have a uh, mainframe, because that's what computers look like, right? Uh, and uh, around the world, we have people connecting to this world computer. Now, I've uh, very deliberately used this. Um, I mean, this isn't actually a computer, but um, it's part of the IBM mainframe of uh, years uh, gone by and the world computer that is the ethereum platform it's a single computer it exists on the internet so any of you can connect to it with your computer but it does run about as slowly as one of these ibm mainframes from uh, the 60s so that's just putting things uh, into perspective we're not talking about a supercomputer here we're just talking about something that isn't uh, very good at computation, but the way it does computation has lots of other um, benefits which make the whole thing worthwhile. So, yeah, it's a virtual machine that uh, can be accessed um, by anyone that has a internet connection. And crucially, it's a service that provides trusted computation and um, uh, memory storage, persistent storage. So more persistent than um, just about any other sort of uh, data that uh, storage you can think of. So just to build things up from the bottom, um, just quickly go through blockchains. Is there, who here has heard of blockchains? OK, good. So not everyone's hand went up there. Um, who here has uh, heard of uh, Bitcoin? Uh, oh, everyone's hand has gone up there. OK, fair enough. So you all know that Bitcoin was the uh, first uh, blockchain. So you know it's got first mover advantage. It's really important because um, it's the one that's been running the longest. It's uh, very buggy, but not in any um, debilitating way. So that's, that's great. It's still uh, running. Um, and to think about what um, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain does. Um, I've split it into three areas. So what you would use the Bitcoin um, platform for, uh, why you'd use it, and how it delivers that. So that this maybe uh, hopefully is, is obvious to you, but um, I've talked to lots of people who confuse many aspects of uh, of what blockchains do in a four, so I thought I'd uh, put this in. So it's uh, the Bitcoin platform, it's a blockchain, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, so it has the robustness of a peer-to-peer -peer network, and uh, uses uh, proof of work to achieve uh, guaranteed correctness. So it's a peer-to-peer, -peer, which gives it the property of being decentralized, like the internet, and uh, it's necessarily um, cryptographically secure. So cryptography is a fundamental part of this. And all of this comes together to allow you to transfer Bitcoins to one another. So, you know, that I think this really demonstrates uh, that Bitcoin really was, you know, very much a proof of concept, you know, first implementation, right? You know, what can we do with this uh, concept of a decentralized, um, secure platform 
let's keep a tally of uh, how many tokens uh, each of us have. Now, you know, there is a scripting language built in there, but it's disabled. So, you know, this is basically what you can do with uh, Bitcoin. You can transfer Bitcoins to one another. But you can do so in uh, a guaranteed way, which is um, something that hadn't happened before without some um, trusted uh, entity in charge of the whole thing. So the fact that uh, the Bitcoin blockchain allows you to transfer value to uh, anyone else in the world and does that without being uh, operated by any single entity is you know, a fundamental achievement here. Okay, so obviously uh, I think Ethereum is um, far superior. Um, so it is more advanced in uh, many respects. So Ethereum was developed from scratch. So it's not based on um, the Bitcoin code base at all. So completely new uh, code base. And while it shares the same underlying mechanism, so it is a blockchain, uh, it is peer-to-peer, -peer, it uses proof of work um, to secure the uh, platform. So it has the same property of decentralization, uh, guaranteed correctness, and uh, it's cryptographic so secure. Um, the Ethereum blockchain allows you to perform arbitrary computation, which is great. So beyond just the computation of checking whether or not your Bitcoin balance is uh, sufficiently large for you to transfer uh, X Bitcoin to someone else, on the Ethereum blockchain, you can do um, any computation you want. Hence the term world computer. So you can upload any computer program you want to the Ethereum platform, and then anyone can have it executed, which is uh, great. Also, there is um, persistent storage uh, on the uh, Ethereum blockchain. This is beyond the sense that it exists on um, Bitcoin. So, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is a record of everything that's happened in the Bitcoin network. But for any given transaction, it only uses um, data regarding the immediately preceding transaction. So the Bitcoin blockchain works in a fundamentally different way. Whereas on the Ethereum blockchain, it really does work like a computer in that you have accounts that store information and that information persists with that account and you can draw upon that uh, information uh, at any time and it stays there from one block to the next. Uh, I pressed the uh, wrong button for the laser there. So uh, when I try and uh, sell this to developers, so if there are any um, budding blockchain developers here, then you'll be pleased to know that um, Ethereum comes with uh, cryptographic identity built in, well, just like Bitcoin, and uh, it goes further than um, um, other services that you might develop applications on by giving you ready access to creating your own payment logic. So, you know, lots of people who are setting up a new website, uh, two of the fundamental things they do, if um, you know, you're creating a new service for the internet, you need to somehow um, manage user accounts and then control how they uh, pay for things. And these are two mechanisms that are built into the Ethereum platform. So that's one reason which makes the Ethereum platform an attractive platform in which to develop uh, applications, internet services. Okay, so a motivating example. Hopefully you all don't need a motivating example, but um, I'm going to go through one just to make sure that we're all um, thinking about the same sort of thing. So here's the example of, no, it's this button. Uh, here's an example of somebody uh, using the service of a taxi um, to gain a new location. So the user gains a new location and um, they pay for that uh, change in location with money. So uh, exchange of um, commodities here and uh, you know the new person goes off and then the taxi goes and finds someone else who wants a new location. 
So how can blockchains um, make this better? How can Ethereum change the way this service um, is provided? So when you get into a taxi, the taxi driver doesn't actually know whether you can uh, pay for the trip that you're asking for. Now, I don't know if that's happened to you, but you often see taxis pull up outside a ATM and then the person runs out and extracts uh, cash and gets back into the taxi because, in fact, they did get into the taxi without enough uh, money to pay for it. With um, an Ethereum um, contract managing this process, so a program on the Ethereum blockchain, on the world computer, what you can do is send that contract uh, some money together with a request for location and this contract can then take ownership of that money. Now you're not giving your money to um, a person or an institution or a company, you're actually giving it to a computer program which in itself is a new concept. And that computer program which has you know, computer code which governs how it operates and governs how it spends the money that it receives actually becomes, um, in all sense of the word, custodian of that money. Now being a computer program you can obviously give it arbitrary other information, so giving it the location you want to go to um, is obviously a useful thing for a um, taxi service. And now the taxi owner who uh, trusts this uh, escrow contract because it runs on the trusted network that is the Ethereum computer, can see that the money is there to pay for this trip and you know, can get the information about where to go from uh, the request. And then as uh, you travel to the new location, the taxi can upload the position, you know, GPS upload, so the contract is always aware, this computer program is always aware of where the taxi is. And it could be that the passenger doesn't necessarily trust that the taxi driver is uploading the correct GPS coordinates. Uh, so the, ta the um, uh, customer's phone can also be uploading uh, coordinates. And you know, if these are, don't match up at some point, then this whole um, uh, exchange of services can be cancelled. Stop the car, I'm getting out. Um, but assuming that um, these remain in sync, then when the correct location is reported to the ESCO contract, then the ESCO contract can release the payment to the taxi driver. So, and this is all done without any um, company or uh, explicit servers being deployed for this. Um, so we have a new way of, uh, of operating here. Now, this in itself, for me, isn't quite enough to really say, oh yeah, we should all start using um, blockchain technology right now. But what is important is that the um, contract can also manage things such as verified certification. So at the moment, when you get in a taxi, you probably just go off the colours of the taxi um, for as verification that you know, this is a taxi that you can ask for in the street. I mean, obviously, if you ring up a number, then that's, that's a different um, service. But if you're in the street and you hail a taxi, you see the taxi, and if it's the right colours, you go, yeah, this is, this is a taxi. If you're particularly concerned, you might look for the licence plate of the taxi. This is a... Uh, verified you know, taxi service. Look, the authorities of this city have given them a special license plate. And you might even look for the badge that uh, the taxi driver has to say that you know, they're in some way certified to be uh, a taxi, uh, taxi service provider. Because you might be concerned about you know, whether they're actually able to drive a car, whether their um, vehicle is in good roadworthy condition you know, whether they have any history of kidnapping people that they give rights to. So certification, you know, is an important part of uh, service provision. 
And um, the blockchain, I would argue, is a better way of conveying certification than bits of paper. So when you have a cryptographically signed certificate that the car is uh, roadworthy and a cryptographically signed certificate that you know, they have no criminal record and are able to drive um, manual cars, then you can be a lot more sure that that certification is genuine compared to um, you know, physical objects such as license plates and um, uh, printouts. So it could be that the you know, escrow contract um, only accepts um, um, service provision from certified taxis. So that's an extra thing here which is, can be built into the logic of the escrow contract and adds confidence to the person using the service. Now at the um, other end, you could say that um, you want an enhanced uh, taxi service where the amount you pay depends on the quality of your journey. So I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where you really need to get to the um, train station, to the airport, and you get infuriated that the taxi driver has taken the route you know to, to be longer or ends up in, uh, in traffic. Or there's something which means that your trip is not taking the amount of time you expect. So it'd be good to be able to reward taxi drivers that can take more efficient routes, avoiding traffic and generally getting you to a destination uh, in better time economically. So you will pay, you're willing to pay more if the taxi driver gets you to the airport faster, without breaking the law of course. But how do you judge you know, whether or not the route that was taken was uh, a good route? How can you, you know, hold the taxi driver to account? You know, there needs to be some source of knowledge about you know, what routes are good, whether or not the route that was taken was the best and such. And we're already seeing um, being developed on the Ethereum platform uh, prediction markets which can provide exactly that sort of information. So now this contract, this computer program that has taken control of your money can receive a feed of information about the routes that should be taken through a city and of course it has all the GPS coordinates of the route that you were taking along and if the route that was taken was in some way bad or good, the payment that's made can be adjusted to reflect that. And the taxi driver can't complain because at the beginning the taxi driver signed up to this very, um, uh, this very payment scheme and also it was programmatically controlled all the way through so it wasn't that um, there was some uh, qualitative arbitration that needed to be done. It's like you clearly went uh, the longer route, not the shortest route. Now, this sort of thing to this level of um, trust isn't really possible. So you can you know, complain to uh, Uber that your taxi driver made you miss your train unnecessarily, and Uber might even say, OK, we don't like you to be sad. Here, have five euros of uh, Uber credit. But it's just entirely up to their, um, uh, their judgment, you know, their idea of what your custom is worth to them. Whereas here, it emphasizes, this setup emphasizes the um, contract between the people involved. You as someone who wants uh, to use a taxi and the taxi as someone who wants more customers rather than this third party Uber who are just judging you know, both you and the taxi driver as um, potential users of um, their platform. So here we have a system that is Uber, but without the company Uber, which is kind of nice. Just for general understanding, yeah, so there are those freelance portals, right, where you like, uh, you, you as a developer, you can say, okay, I have those skills and uh, somebody will 
order my programs, right? My yes. Software. And essentially, they have also this mechanism where you like you need to show the money that is blocked by this portal, and then as soon as uh, the software is delivered, they will pay out this money. And mm -hmm. essentially, what you're doing is su something similar, right? But you try to um, to essentially lift it to another scale, right? Can I see it like this? Yes. So the question there was um, how much. To what extent does this um, uh, reflect the current uh, platforms where you give money to the, the platform, it holds it in a scroll, um, and then you receive some service which is being advertised on this platform, such as um, uh, provision of uh, code. And this is exactly right. So it's, it's an ability to um, uh, provide exchange platforms and a trusted escrow mechanism holding the money um, out of the hands of both parties until the other half of the deal is uh, concluded in an automated fashion. So with code, it's a bit harder because how do you judge whether the code has been uh, delivered or not? Mm -hmm. But in principle, yes, that's exactly right. I see, but essentially you want uh, to apply your techniques to, uh, to, essentially to the products which can be judged automatically. Yes, and as um, things progress, it'll become possible to have more and more things judged in some sense automatically. So the code, for example, it could go to a anonymous code review committee, which is actually a million people around the world being paid an incredibly small amount to say whether code is good or not, mm. maybe. Yeah. But your current market is about taxes, is it correct? Taxes. Taxes, about uh, like driving and so on. This is just uh, an example that I've picked to hopefully get um, you thinking in the right way. Yeah. Um, the computer program that represents this contract yes. in the customer interface, where does this come from? Uh, so someone needs to write that and upload it onto the Ethereum platform. But this needs then also to be certified in trust. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, now, just a couple of examples of um, significant um, uh, contracts, significant programs that exist right now on the Ethereum platform. Um, one notable one is the DAO. So this uh, acronym is, uh, stands for Distributed or Decentralized Autonomous Organization and is becoming the, the term, the acronym for um, service provision in general on the Ethereum platform. So this, you know, this concept of computer programs running as uh, organizations that provide services. So um, decentralized autonomous organization. And someone um, who wrote the program that I'm just about to describe for successful marketing um, hype called their DAO, the DAO, which makes things a bit confusing but it was just a it's just a name so the DAO is one example of DAOs in general and this one is Kickstarter without the company Kickstarter so uh, this DAO accepts money so you give this uh, DAO money and then it becomes custodian of it and then people submit to it proposals for projects um, that will be funded by the money that this DAO has. This DAO is a computer program with a um, voting mechanism in it. And then all the people that have put money into this program can vote on whether or not a particular proposal should receive the amount requested or not. And if the uh, vote is successful, then the money is paid out. And if it's not, then the money is not paid out. Now, Kickstarter obviously does a similar thing. Um, it also provides a mechanism for actually advertising the uh, proposals for projects, um, as well as the um, voting mechanism and the receipt of uh, funds and then the paying out of uh, funds. They obviously take a, a cut for providing that service. Um, and of course, when you give money to Kickstarter, 
you just assume due to um, uh, company regulation that Kickstarter will do with that money what you expect. And, you know, on the whole, they do. Occasionally, they might do something slightly different, but as long as it's within their terms and conditions, then, you know, you can't do anything. The terms and conditions for the DAO, the DAO um, Kickstarter um, program, are described in computer code. So you can read that computer code, and they're all of the conditions. And if you like the conditions as described by that computer code, then you can give it money. And then you know exactly how that uh, money will be uh, used, because the computer code describes what it will do. Another uh, good example is um, uh, Bernie Madoff, who made off with a lot of people's money in a Ponzi scheme. And you know, that's been much harder to pull off when the mechanism by which the money is processed can be read as a uh, computer program. So you know, we're already, even though Ethereum's only 10 months old, we're already getting quite um, visionary uh, applications. Uh, another example is Maker. So, you know, if you've um, uh, tried to uh, speculate with Bitcoin or even just, you know, hold Bitcoin for more than just one transaction, then you'll be aware of the crazy volatility of the price of Bitcoin as measured in dollars or euros. You know, it goes up and down by uh, up to 10, 20 percent a day. So this is huge volatility in the price of uh, cryptocurrencies. Same with uh, Ether, which is the currency of the Ethereum platform. Um, and a lot of people say, right, it would be great if these cryptocurrencies weren't as volatile in relation to another currency, if there was some stability there. And some people have written this DAO, this uh, Ethereum uh, program, in order to uh, manage the issuance of a new cryptocurrency called DAI. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that. And this DAO, this computer program, manages this cryptocurrency such that its price remains stable. So here we have a computer program effectively taking on the role of uh, a commercial bank that um, is currently the main mechanism that we have in um, our countries for uh, creating new money, or uh, when governments do it, and they currently call that quantitative easing or uh, devaluation, perhaps. But here we have these uh, issuance of new currency being managed by a computer program, which uh, in itself is, again, a new, a new concept. OK, so for the uh, blockchain Bitcoin aficionados of the audience, here's a bit for you. This is a, a model of what the Bitcoin blockchain does. There are lots of people who want to use the Bitcoin blockchain. They submit transactions to the Bitcoin network. Please pay this person three Bitcoins. So all of these transactions are um, held in a pool. And then a miner, who also acts as um, verifier, picks valid transactions from the pool and knows which ones are valid by verifying them against um, the existing data on the Bitcoin blockchain, then does some proof of work mining and adds this new transaction to the next block of the uh, Bitcoin blockchain. So the main thing here is transactions are verified and then added. And each transaction is a transfer of funds. So by contrast, Ethereum, um, while it starts out in the same way, you have people using the Ethereum world computer, the Ethereum platform, they submit transactions to the Ethereum computer, to the Ethereum network. And again, you have miners that also act as verifiers, and they um, create a list of 
uh, transactions, where each transaction can either create a new computer program. So we call a computer program on the Ethereum network a contract. So create a new contract program. It can, the transaction can request a transfer of funds, or the transaction can request that an existing program, an existing contract, is executed. And any of these things can happen. They can happen in combination. They happen one at a time, so this, this can't happen in parallel. One execution or contract creation has to complete before the next one starts. But the miners verify that uh, all of these um, are valid requests and calculate the outcome. So who gets how much new money, what's the new um, memory state of that uh, contract, secures it with a proof of work and we have a new state. Also with uh, Ethereum, the uh, contracts and accounts are distinct and persistent. So unlike in Bitcoin, where the, um, the uh, state is held as unspent transaction outputs, in Ethereum, they are actually uh, persistent accounts with their associated state. So just to um, uh, reduce this to a general description. You with your um, computer can uh, sign a instruction for the Ethereum world computer uh, with your cryptographic identity and then the Ethereum world computer will process, uh, process that instruction and return to you what the outcome is. That's basically what's, uh, what's going on here. And uh, if you want to set this up then you can download an Ethereum client, a daemon, and have that running. And that daemon talks over a peer-to-peer -peer network with the rest of the um, uh, participants and passes on the instructions that you give it via your uh, Ethereum interface. So at the moment, the best one to use is just a web browser interface. Um, and it does that over JSON RPC to the uh, daemon and then that passes it on over peer-to-peer -peer network and then the state network uh, state is propagated back again so you can see what the outcome is. Ideally you want these two things to be on the same machine. So uh, because it's uh, RPC then you want to keep that uh, nicely uh, ring fenced so that um, people from uh, outside can't hijack your instructions and just add into them that they want to um, transfer them uh, a large amount of your uh, cryptocurrency. Which has happened. People have uh, not heeded this advice and lost their money, which is a shame. But. So as I said before, there are three um, instructions, three types of instructions that you can give Ethereum, the Ethereum world computer, the Ethereum network. You can create a new contract with its own program code. You can ask for an existing contract to be executed. And to do that, you may need to provide a certain amount of money or some particular data um, or you can just transfer ether to someone and you can do a combination of these so you can create a new contract with s some ether in its holdings at, at the start or you can execute a function and transfer ether using that. Can you give an example of a program? So yes absolutely so uh, I'll just quickly um, go through what a Ethereum contract is just you know to sort of computer science level. So it's Ethereum virtual machine code and as I said before persistent storage. So every contract on the Ethereum world computer has its own uh, memory. Uh, 2 to the 256 um, words of uh, 256 bytes so uh, as much um, memory as you need. It's also really expensive but uh, we can come back to that. And every time a contract uh, is executed, then a fresh virtual machine is instantiated. The contract's code is loaded into that VM's ROM. And this is important um, to flag up the fact that once you've uploaded a program to Ethereum, it can't be changed. So if you think that uh, you might want to change it, you have to build in change logic into your program. If you're 
unsure about whether your code is buggy or not, don't upload it until you're sure that your, comp that your program is not buggy. Um, the contract storage is loaded into the VM's RAM, as you'd expect. And then all of the other uh, various components of uh, a usual virtual machine are initiated. And then uh, the contract is executed. So, uh, and then afterwards, everything is loaded. Uh, the new state, so you, know, you can change the state arbitrarily. That is uh, saved back onto the uh, blockchain so that when it, the program is executed next time, the changes persist. These are the opcodes, all the usual things, stop, add, uh, equality, um, uh, particular things, gas price, uh, create contract, um, local storage, uh, persistent storage, um, extra things like uh, time spam, Coinbase, which are related to the uh, actual block. But um, otherwise, you know, just sort of standard um, uh, machine opcodes. Writing everything in opcodes isn't generally uh, the most accessible way to program a computer. So we've developed, uh, well, many, many actually, but um, this high level language in particular, this is called Solidity. It's designed to you know, be a bit C-like, you know, look a little bit like uh, JavaScript or Python. Um, and you can you know, create a new uh, class, a new contract type. You have um, mappings. So here we create a coin balance register, which maps people's addresses to their balance. Um, and we uh, uh, signify that we want events to be recorded when someone transfers um, the money token of this uh, contract for a new currency from somebody to someone else and how much they transferred. So this is basically a, uh, a contract. This is the entire code required to implement Bitcoin on Ethereum. So you can uh, get the balance of uh, somebody and uh, or you can send money to them just by sending an execution request to this contract that manages the entire money supply for this particular currency to say, I want to um, send money to this particular person and I want to send this amount. And of course, it has to be checked that the person sending this request has enough money. So if they're trying to send uh, more than they actually have, then the um, code execution is terminated there. Otherwise, the balance of the person sending the money is decremented, the balance of the person receiving the money is incremented, and the coin transfer event is uh, raised so that there's an easy log for people to search for uh, on the platform. And then uh, we end. So while the, um, the opcode program is a lot more involved in this, the Solidity language allows you to um, write uh, programs which do stuff that you might want to do relatively easily. So this is why Ethereum is a lot more powerful than um, Bitcoin, because uh, you, Bitcoin is very much a subset of Ethereum's capabilities. No. Um, Bitcoin cannot do this. Well, Bitcoin can do that particular contract because this contract implements Bitcoin. But um, Bitcoin's scripting functionality is incredibly limited. Yeah, sure. But that's why I said that you are doing essentially an extra layer, right? Because you are taking those increment operators or decrement. This is something what is supported by Bitcoin, right? And then you say, OK, now we will add an expressive language on top so that we can write such scripts? So um, it's more than that, mainly because um, it's pseudo-Turing complete. Mm -hmm. So Bitcoin doesn't have any sort of um, 
uh, looping functionality. So you just can't do uh, as much on Bitcoin as you can on Ethereum. So immediately the capability is much more on Ethereum than it is on Bitcoin. The only similarity is that the um, same blockchain powered by a proof of work schedule is used. But that's the only similarity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I think my point was that you're essentially using Bitcoin as an interface, right? Clearly, your whole machinery extends Bitcoin uh, greatly, right? Um, so that's like saying that um, my, smart cone, uh, my, my smartphone just extends the capability of a calculator. Sure, and this is true, right? So if that's what you mean by extends, then sure. But this phone doesn't use a calculator's uh, API. It does more than that. Yeah, but I see, yeah. It, it extends the concept, absolutely. It is a blockchain. It is a proof-of-work blockchain. So in that sense, you're exactly right. But in terms of capability, this is a step change in capability. Yeah, but I understand that you have essential, uh, essential change. I don't want to say this is something small, right? I just want to understand better what you have done. But yeah, it is still a... So all of the um, characteristics of decentralization, uh, guaranteed um, uh, computation, and um, cryptographic security, Yes, they're all exactly the same. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Um, OK, so I've gone up and down in the level of uh, detail. I hope that some of that was useful uh, to you. Um, so let's just go back to the high level um, again. It's the um, Economist magazine. They described the Ethereum platform um, as a trust machine. So, you know, the uh, elements that I'm trying to get across here about, um, you know, being able to rely on the outcome made, uh, yeah, the economist journalists think of it as being the trusted third party without it being a party. So, whenever you have a, an application, a service, that um, can be expressed as some sort of um, agreement based on uh, a set of logic um, conditions that need to be enforced uh, in an asynchronous fashion, then the trust machine is a great way to uh, achieve that. The Ethereum platform, the world computer, is a good way of um, achieving that because it provides um, logic, execution of logic, it uh, has uh, state that that logic can be based on and it has um, a notion of uh, identity. So with these three things um, you can achieve uh, a lot. Okay, so that was sort of like the first half of the uh, talk to make sure that um, the notion of what Ethereum is is hopefully with you. Um, now I'm going to talk more about the Ethereum project as a process, a sort of, you know, historical account of it. Are there any questions about what I've said so far that uh, might help you um, before I go into the next section? Your point? There's one. Okay. Um, yeah, there's something I didn't quite understand. So you said that Ethereum is so far to take the example of the taxi uh, Ethereum is a way to provide a service like Uber but without the company. Correct. But then there's somebody who will write the code at the beginning at the beginning. Yes. So this guy will be will be responsible for any problem with this? No. Okay, so nobody is responsible if the code is buggy and Oh, you're responsible for it? And second question, where does the money you get from this come from? Do you take some money on every transaction? Do you, how do you, how does it work? Uh, so yeah, I'll answer them in reverse order. So the money that you can, you can use for that um, escrow contract example could be any 
cryptocurrency that exists on the Ethereum network. Yeah, that, that's not and you can just uh, buy that. How do you, uh, how does the company Ethico get paid when someone uses Ethereum? Uh, they don't. Okay. So, so the, it's the um, mining validators who are running the network, you know, under the hood, as it were. They get um, fees for making the system work. So they get a source of funds in two ways. One, they get given freshly minted Ether, just like in, in Bitcoin, there's a block reward. So uh, every 12 seconds, uh, new Ether comes into existence. So there's you know, an inflationary effect there. Um, also, you have to pay to um, have a contract uploaded or executed. So when you enter that uh, taxi or scrow contract, part of the money that you give the contract will be passed on to the, uh, the verifiers, the mining network that's running the whole thing. Um, so yeah, so to go on to the, the next question about right, who's responsible. So ultimately, you, you are responsible for choosing which taxi escrow contract to use. There'll be many available to you, and you'll have heard that this one is better, and you use it, and you use it at your risk. Just like when you go to an ATM, you use it at your risk. If it doesn't give you money, then, then you, go to the bank. you go to the bank and they say, well, we have, uh, we have looked through the records and the amount of money that was in our machine exactly matches uh, all of the transactions. So that, whenever I've heard a story about ATMs not giving out money, the bank has always refused to refund that money because the ATM operator says, we will look at the records of our ATM and get back to you. And then they, if they ever get back to you, they say, the records are completely uh, correct. So you obviously did receive your money. So unless you film the machine every time you withdraw cash out of an APM, then... That's cool. I've never, you're the first person I've talked to of three people that, uh, that had that story. But anyway, the, 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 the point here is that um, yes, it is in some respects, buy beware. But we will see an ecosystem evolving where um, there'll be people who review code and um, rate that code. So, you know, the Ethereum Foundation will be one, the open, um, um, uh, oh, what are they called? Open Software Foundation. No, that's not what they're called. Free Software Foundation. Um, you know, IBM might start reviewing people's code. There'll be private firms that say, you know, if you pay us, we will give you a gold star. So you will have a number of taxi escrow contracts to choose from, and they'll be rated. So you'll see that they've been certified by various bodies. And you pick the one that's been certified by the bodies you trust. And, you know, you should pick one that's been certified by at least three or whatever. So. Uh, You know, at this stage, I don't suggest you use uh, an Ethereum taxi go contract to get to the airport. But in five years' time, it could well be possible, you know, that as the ecosystem uh, builds up. Just like at the moment, we do already have an ecosystem around the provision of goods and services and, you know, laws and um, arbitrators and um, um, uh, regulators. The same thing will happen. Um, for uh, digital uh, service provision, yeah. So you mentioned uh, some fees for transactions. Yes. Uh, is it essentially your business model, like you uh, essentially you charge for every transaction? Um, no, it's not my business model, or even the Ethereum Foundation's business model, because neither no one uh, no one entity receives those fees. That fee goes to the network, and that network is a um, distributed uh, number of 
individuals and uh, operations mm -hmm. who are mostly independent of each other and those fees get effectively spread equally upon them in exactly the same way as mm, uh, minor rewards in Bitcoin. Um, the project is non-profit. Yeah. So the Ethereum project is actually um, a idea. So the Ethereum project is a open source project hosted on GitHub, but um, it was oh, it came out of um, a white paper that was published in November 2013. So someone had a good idea, Vitalik Buterin, and oh yeah, having a Turing complete, pseudo Turing complete scripting language on a blockchain, this seems like a good idea. So described, described that. Um, a few people wrote proof of concept, implementing this idea over the Christmas period at the end of 2013. So by the beginning of 2014, we had the first working versions of um, the Ethereum platform. Um, then, soon after, uh, Gavin Wood wrote a formal specification of actually how this protocol would work and how clients implementing this platform would talk to each other. And it wasn't until um, August 2014 when the group of people working on this, the group of people at the the centre of, of this, because you know it already built up quite a, a disparate community at this point. You know, open source project, lots of people um, uh, working on it. Um, the group of people at the centre, headed by Vitalik Buterin, created a uh, foundation in Switzerland and uh, um, set that up as a way to help fund the project. So it wasn't that the Ethereum Foundation was trying to take ownership of the project just that they wanted to be the organisers to ensure that this project came to fruition. And then um, at the end of 2014, uh, they launched a crowdfunding round, uh, which raised uh, $18 million, uh, which is pretty good. You can do a lot with $18 million. Unfortunately, they raised it all in Bitcoin, which then proceeded to uh, drop in price by two thirds. So they only actually had uh, eight or nine million dollars, million dollars to spend, but they're still pretty good. So then um, a development uh, company was uh, created with developers in Berlin, Amsterdam and London because you know, this is a project with lots of people all over the place. And they then spent um, the next uh, year or so taking these proof of concepts and really honing them and use spending this money on security audits and making all this code really good. And then it was launched by the community in general um, in July 2015. And then uh, at the beginning of this year, the whole network was upgraded, upgraded with a few important um, tweaks to the protocol. Um, and that's uh, where we are now. So all of, this, uh, all of this money was spent up until about this point. Um, but when the, uh, the network was launched, the community quite generously gave a a large chunk of Ether to the Ethereum Foundation. Um, and now Ether is worth uh, uh, quite a lot. So the Ethereum Foundation is now funded again. So this is a graph of um, the price of Ether. So the market cap is now, oh, this is in, in Bitcoins. I should have changed the, uh, uh, what's on this side? Oh yeah, that's dollars, right. So um, this line is million dollars. So the the value of all Ether in existence is uh, above a million dollars. No, it must be a hundred million. No, it's three zeros. I tried to get the um, uh, a vector graphics version of this, but it didn't work. So this is a PNG. Uh, a billion dollars. Yeah, there you go. That's a bit more impressive, isn't it? A billion dollars. Uh, yeah. So the, the Ethereum, the Ethereum platform, is worth a billion dollars. The uh, Ethereum project has none of that, that's just volunteers. The Ethereum foundation has um, several million dollars of that total worth and the rest of it is held by private people. Um, so 
we're running out of time, so I'm just going to shorten the uh, story of why uh, it was really interesting being part of the Ethereum project viewed from a startup perspective. And it basically comes down to the fact that it was the right idea at the right time. So Bitcoin uh, had already gone through its um, all-time high. So everyone was not only uh, impressed about the ideology that Bitcoin brought, the you know, new technical revolution, but also um, just really excited by the fact that um, some people had gained in wealth 10 times. So, you know, money's always a, uh, a strong factor in this. So people were looking out for new blockchain-based projects. There'd been a raft of copycat projects which all added small features to the Bitcoin idea. Um, and none of those made it because they were all small incremental um, uh, extensions. And so when Ethereum came on and said, right, all of those small extensions, they can all be implemented and more on this one single blockchain, a lot of people very quickly realized that this was a really good thing. So right from the start, the Ethereum project had a considerable uh, mind share and, and support. And while there are lots of people saying, oh, it'll never work, you know, the, the, there's, it didn't matter. There was a, enough people were attracted by the, the um, innate idea here that um, it grew very quickly. So talent is incredibly important to actually deliver stuff. And so right from the start, there were you know, world-class developers working on this, um, people, angel investors strongly attracted to it. Uh, excellent uh, marketing people. So very quickly, a community engagement program sort of just evolved and became very strong, drumming up support and excitement about the whole thing. Now, the fact that it was an open source code base really helped. So very few um, new projects can actually um, uh, take full advantage of you know, having an open source code base. Um, but it was perfect for the Ethereum project. And so this made it much easier to have people organizing meetups and hackathons to you know, get uh, community behind this. Um, a lot of effort was put into answering questions on forums, uh, Stack Exchange, you know, Reddit was obviously uh, really important, and then all the usual social media stuff. So a huge amount of um, effort went into uh, community engagement. And this meant that there was a really strong um, hinterland ecosystem already developing right from the, uh, the start. So in some ways, it matches the standard sort of, you know, startup um, uh, dream flow. So, you know, a, a strong idea leading to a group of people with a shared vision so that um, with a shared vision, less communication needs to happen. So if you have a group of people that can all see the end game, then they do, there doesn't need to be as much discussion about how to achieve that. So that was uh, really important. And then attracting lots of talent for little or no pay, um, a lot of effort going into um, making the public in general receptive to the product, um, and then continue engagement to keep the momentum of interest going. And you could see that with the, um, uh, with the graph here. So this is, you know, in some ways, a uh, indication of uh, interest. So there's a little blip. This is launch, lots of excitement at the beginning, then a uh, developer conference. Oh my goodness, people are actually building stuff on this. That's really uh, exciting. And then this was the new year. And then suddenly it's, you know, fear of missing out and uh, off we go. So, um, you know, in many ways, this was a classic startup graft, but in others, um, there was this uh, above average uh, situation of a concept that was just at the right moment in the right time and really um, chimed with a lot of people. So just to finish off, the key point here is that um, the, while the internet provided a decentralized infrastructure for communication, Right. It's now, you know, the China and Burma and um, Egypt, they, you know, these com countries try and stop communication using the internet, but it's really hard. Um, what the Ethereum project aims to do is have a 
decentralized service platform running on the internet that makes computation, in some sense, hard to stop. So with this, as the, you saw me struggling trying to convey ideas to you, we have uh, the ability to actually do things that human have not been able to do before on scales that we haven't done them. So hopefully some of the excitement behind that statement um, has got across to you today. Okay, thanks very much.